Can we start with your full name, please? I'm Yoshio C. Nakamura. And can you spell that for me? Y-O-S-H-I-O, capital C, dot, Nakamura, N-A-K-A-M-U-R-A. Perfect. And where and when were you born? I was uh, born in 1925 in Rosemead, California. I went to what was then Rio Hondo Elementary School mm -hmm. in Rosemead and went through the sixth grade. Uh, our farm was cut in half when Rosemead Boulevard was um, cut through from nor uh, north to south. And uh, it was a hazardous thing to have to cross a highway to tend to a farm. So uh, we moved to El Monte. Mm -hmm. So from the seventh grade on, I went to El Monte schools. First to Columbia School, which was uh, for the seventh and eighth grade. And uh, then El Monte High School mm -hmm. it was called El Monte Union High School at the time because uh, El Monte had only one high school and now there are four or perhaps more. And uh, what month and what day were you born? Well, I was born on June 30th, 1925. June 30th. And which branch of the military did you serve with? I served in the U.S. Army. I was in the infantry. It was uh, the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Okay. And what was your role uh, within the 442nd? What was your job? Well, I was a private first class mm -hmm. for, for a while. Um, I was in M Company of the 3rd Battalion of the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. My M Company was a heavy weapons company uh, and we <coughs> were uh, concerned mainly with mortars and machine guns. We had small rifles. It was a noisy place, uh, both uh, in terms of our shooting the enemy with uh, mortars and also the enemy shooting us with cannons and mortars also. Mm -hmm. But uh, my role was, for the time I was in, I was a carrier of mortar shell, the shells. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, my name my first name starts with a Y, and the the assignments were made by alphabetical order. So a friend of mine, he became a friend of mine from Idaho, was named Tak Nakamura, started with a T. And so as the assignments came down, he got the heavy mortar plate to carry on his back, and. Uh, so I, then at that time I was thinking, thank God my family called me, named me Yosho. <laughs> why? <laughs> Started with a Y. So uh, that's, uh, and I'll tell you a little story about, uh, about his being, uh, carrying, uh, his carrying the uh, mortar plate and how uh, he fell off the cliff mm. and, we had to rescue him. Was that at uh, it was in Mont Fogarito? Yeah. Yes, Mount Fogarito. It was a, uh, a very, very steep mountain. And I think the, uh, the, the German uh, forces didn't think that any uh, right-minded soldier would ever try to climb the mountain. Mm -hmm. But uh, fortunately, we had uh, Italian partisans who were anti-fascist and knew the pathways very, very well. And so they were our guides. The pathway was about that wide, and just enough for uh, a 
a single person to walk and it wasn't exactly even. I mean, there were you know, all kinds of zigzags. And so uh, it was very, very uh, treacherous mm -hmm. climb. And we had to do it in the dark. Uh, we wanted to, our um, unit was asked, the 442nd, was asked to break the Gothic line. And so uh, uh, we were assigned to knock them out on top of Mount Folgarito and other uh, high places. And so we started out when it was pitch black and we climbed uh, to the top. And fortunately uh, for us, none of the men in my company, is, to my knowledge, my squad, uh, uh, fell off the cliff, but I understand some did and you know fell to their death because mm -hmm. it was a very very steep mountain uh, in the case of tack nakamura he was in front of me so we were able to keep contact by uh, putting our hands on the back of each other mm -hmm. and uh, suddenly we discovered that he wasn't there and then later we hear this whisper help get up, you know, you couldn't talk because uh, we'd tip off the, the surprise attack on these outposts. So we, when we noticed that he was gone and he whispered and we went back down the, the path and we found him like a turtle. The shell was on the bottom and he just couldn't get up. And so we, a couple of us got him up and luckily he wasn't injured. So we continued going up. So that's uh, probably the most memorable part of that trip up the mountain, uh, besides uh, my wondering if I'd ever make it. Uh, but the fact that uh, uh, we found Tack uh, planted <laughs> on the pathway uh, was, it was a pleasant surprise for us yeah. that he was okay. So the, the heavy mortar plate was too heavy uh, for him to, to get back up. Oh, yes. Well, he's down in his back. Mortar plate is planted in the soil of the pathway, and uh, no way could he get himself up. And if he rolled over, he could roll over on the other side. That's how narrow the path was. Yes, it was very, very narrow. So, uh, no, it was, it was uh, well, we couldn't see anything. I mean, it was dark. So... Uh, feel the, the, the width of the pathway mm -hmm. and it was quite uneven so it was a uh, an experience that probably I'll never forget wow. and very thankful that I made it, was able to get to the top. Yeah. Um, I'd like to, to revisit that uh, a little bit later on and mm -hmm. uh, ask you some more detail about that. Um, now, did you, were you promoted beyond uh, PFC? Yes, uh, eventually I became a staff sergeant. Okay. So, uh, there has been, uh, some men had enough time uh, and after the war was, has, was concluded, was ended, uh, that they could go home. So, uh, uh, as people with higher ranks left and uh, made it possible for us PFCs to move up. So I became a corporal and later on, eventually be a staff sergeant. And it was, it was good. Uh, I, I uh, felt that I, I, I have some uh, skill with leadership and so it was not a difficult thing for me. <laughs> now, what years did you serve from and until? Oh, uh, well, I, I, I'll have to look at my records on that. I, I was there in, let's see, I, 
I was trained in 1944 and went overseas and uh, I joined the 442nd um, as a group of us who were replacing the men who had been injured or were killed in action in France. So uh, we, we put on cattle cars to disguise the troop movements and we went from Le Havre um, close to the English Channel to uh, southern France and we were assigned to the 442nd in southern France and we, I, I saw some uh, combat there and that's when uh, General Mark Clark of the 5th Army in Italy requested that the 442nd return to Italy uh, to break the Gothic line. So uh, I'm not exactly uh, in tune with uh, boats. I, I get seasick very easily and we went from southern France to northern Italy on these landing craft boats. Mm -hmm. uh, those are made with the flat bottoms and so there's a lot of rocking and all I remember I, I was uh, rather miserable. Yeah. Not a pleasant so, experience you know, I, for you. I, get sea I was a seasick so mm -hmm. uh, but anyway we landed uh, in northern Italy and went by Pisa, the Leaning Tower, into Carrara, which is the marble capital of the world. And uh, from there, we were assigned to climb this very, very steep mountain. <coughs> now, I understand the 442nd is, is the high, high, the highest decorated unit in mm -hmm. military history. Yes, it was the highest decorated unit for its size and the length of service uh, in U.S. Arm, uh, U.S. Armed Forces history. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so they, they had a remarkable record. Uh, I'm fortunate to be around, so I'm given credit for all the work that so many have done before I even got there, but they're not around anymore, so uh, uh, I like to represent them. Sure. Uh, I don't look upon these uh, honors that have been bestowed on me as personal as so much as that I represent these really, uh, the real heroes. Mm -hmm. they, they went through many, many battles. Many of them got injured or were killed in action. So I'd say that uh, I'm, I'm glad that I'm around and I'm glad that I can represent them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, but you know, many, many people think I'm a big hero. And, and uh, when I was being interviewed by the Gopher Broke National Education Center in what they call the Hanashi Project, they're interviewing all of the veterans of the 442nd. And I, told the young uh, videographer and the uh, interviewer like you that I just want you to know I'm not a hero that uh, a lot many, there are a lot many more people uh, deserve that, uh, that honor of being called a hero. But the guy who was doing the video said, don't tell me that. He says, I look upon all of you who serve there as my heroes. Okay, I won't argue with you. <laughs> so, but anyway, I, but I'm glad that I'm still around, that I can uh, uh, represent them. And uh, only yesterday, I gave a talk to uh, a Rotary Club here in Whittier called the Sunrise uh, Whittier. Rotary Club, mm -hmm. and uh, and I'm glad to say that I represented the 442nd 
in telling my story, uh, since I was a part of the 442nd, uh, they can see a real human being standing there talking about an experience mm -hmm. with the uh, this very important unit. Uh, so I'm glad to do that. Now, was it an entirely Nisai unit? It was entirely, uh, with the exception of uh, some officers. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, Japanese Americans were uh, you know, trained, and uh, uh, some of them were uh, went to officer training camp, but uh, most of the us were privates or were foot soldiers. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were other people who had been trained in the officer training camps. And uh, so they were assigned to us. Eventually, many of the fellows who were in the 442nd uh, either got promoted uh, as a result of their uh, being in combat for a long time and knowing quite a few things and, and showing their leadership skills uh, promoted. And uh, and later there were some Nisei who had been in you know, officer training camp and came in and became officers. Mm -hmm. So, but I would say that by and large they were they're all Japanese Americans. Uh, but I can think of two very important uh, Caucasian uh, colonels. One uh, was a colonel in the thirty sixth. Infantry battalion from Texas. It was a National Guard unit. They were the ones who were trapped in the forest in France. And the 442nd was assigned to uh, rescue them. Mm -hmm. uh, the men lost uh, more men than they, they uh, were able to free. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the uh, heartwarming things that I've seen are letters that were sent to the veterans who had rescued the, these men. Uh, the rescued men would never have been fathers. I mean, they, they were trapped, and so the chances of their survival uh, was very slim. They were, running out of ammunition, running out of food, and so the 442nd rescued them, and so when these men got home, they were able to marry and have children, so many of the, the daughters and sons of these veterans would write to the 442nd men saying that, thanking them, because I would never be around if it hadn't been for you, mm -hmm. and uh, and my father wouldn't be around. I would never have known what was happening. So, they, uh, some of them were just really, uh, just really heartwarming, and so that's uh, one part that I'm glad that uh, you know I was part of it and uh, that I know about that, and one of the colonels of the 36th Infantry Battalion from Italy, or from uh, Texas, would attend all, as many uh, events as he could around the country, uh, talking about the bravery of the 442nd. And he said, I'll go anywhere to talk about the 442nd. So I thought that uh, and said a lot for him. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just last uh, October, we had a uh, uh, mini reunion uh, where friends, family of the Nisei soldiers, and our unit here, there's a 100th Battalion Club, which includes all the other Nisei veterans, mm -hmm. uh, had this mini re reunion, and a fellow named uh, Jerry Gustafson was a colonel uh, just out of office training camp and assigned to the 100th Battalion. And when he got there, I'm in charge of these guys. 
they're so small, you know. I mean, uh, the Nisei soldiers were not very tall, and uh, if you were tall, you, you stood up way above them. And uh, and he said uh, he he was kind of astounded with these that he's in charge of these men mm -hmm. and didn't, didn't know very much about them, but as he uh, was in battle and and got to know these men uh, and he heard about the uh, uh, treatment of Japanese Americans on the West Coast, he became a very strong advocate for us. So he. He too would uh, go around and talk about uh, the role of the 442nd. But he and his uh, daughters came to the reunion, and it was just uh, the first time I've met him. Mm -hmm. And uh, certainly we were very happy to include him in the reunion. And I think he had a good time too. Now, did you? Participate in the, in that rescue mission? No, I, I I came because there were so many who had been lost in the rescue that they had to be replaced. Yeah. So, uh, in one way, I was very lucky that I got there after that very very uh, torturous uh, battle, mm -hmm. and uh, and also I, I'm probably here because I wasn't in that battle yeah. uh, in. One of my friends was in I Company, they call it Item Company. When the rescue was concluded, the commanding general in the area uh, wanted to thank the 442nd and ask the men to come uh, to be honored. And uh, he looks out and he sees this I Company. I think only eight men. And he said, I asked all of the women to come. And the uh, person in charge of I Company said, this is all that's left. And uh, I think it uh, uh, made a uh, tremendous impact on this officer because there was, there was a great deal of of uh, injuries and killed in action. Yeah. So uh, I'd say that uh, a lot of credit goes to these men who, who did the grunt work. I mean, yeah. it was a, a terrible situation. It was muddy and in the forest, and uh, it's a very little place to hide. <laughs> and uh, you know there were targets, yeah. but uh, 442nd managed to uh, rescue them and capture the German soldiers. And, and you you mentioned earlier about the size of of the soldiers in your unit, and mm -hmm. you told me earlier how much how much did you weigh when you joined? Well, the I was probably around 109 pounds. Mm -hmm. I probably was one of the lightest. In my company, uh, the even with sea rations, those weren't exactly uh, gourmet things. Uh, I gained some weight, but uh, I gained a lot more weight after I got out, out of the service. So uh, I would imagine you were probably carrying about that much weight uh, on your back. At oh uh, yes, I I was exactly. I wasn't stocky. Uh, Tak Nakamura was stocky. I mean, he, he was not as tall as I was, but he was wider, and uh, the base plate was made for him. <laughs> so, if I were to carry that, it would have been a, a, a very, very heavy uh, uh, chore. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'd, I'd like to talk a, a little bit about your childhood and, sure. and growing up, and your family. Okay. Uh, well, uh, I've been very fortunate that uh, all through my life there are people who come forward to be helpful to me. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we had a small truck garden farm. We grew vegetables and things. And they were marketed in you know, uh, 
grocery stores uh, in San Gabriel Valley. Uh, my father, would, we would uh, harvest uh, our crops and then he would uh, go from store to store and people would buy carrots, beets, you know, broccoli, whatever. And uh, when I was uh, nearing my fifth year, I was five, my mother uh, had been diagnosed with uh, breast cancer. And uh, at that time, the, there was no uh, cure for cancer. Uh, and surgery was one of the options. And my mother didn't want surgery. And there was no sure way that this would be a, a lifesaver. So uh, she passed away. Uh, and uh, fortunately for me, my brother was nine years older. So uh, in a sense, he became my second uh, uh, parent. Uh, he uh, was a wise, uh, very disciplined, uh, um, with high morals. So he was a very good role model. And so uh, I grew up with you know, a single, pa single parent family. And I even had a younger brother and a younger sister. So they even have, I think, a much worse time than I did. Uh, but I was fortunate that my older brother uh, was always uh, there to help me out. And uh, when I went to, uh, it was called Rio Hondo Elementary School, it's now called Savannah. Uh, I had some very fine caring teachers, and one of them uh, became a, a lifetime a friend. Uh, she was my teacher in first grade, and then she became a principal, and uh, uh, took an interest in me. And it seems that all through my life, my teachers and my some friends, neighbors, uh, you know, all, uh, came forth to offer uh, extraordinary help, you know, that uh, uh, when I was in high school, uh, my very good friend Kenneth Morgan's family uh, took me in as like a member of the family. Mm -hmm. So we go on trips, uh, you know, somewhere and they, they would uh, uh, have me come along. So I, I would say that uh, you know, just everywhere I went, it seems uh, there are people who came forth and helped me. Um, Mrs. Paul, uh, Ruth Green Paul, was my first grade teacher and later became the principal. But the remarkable thing about her was that when we were interned and uh, uh, we were in this prison-like camp in Tulare, it was a, called an assembly center. She would walk, come from El Monte to uh, to Larry, and she knew quite a few of the uh, students she had, and uh, including myself. And she would bring over things we couldn't get in the camp, something we needed. Uh, she would be there. But anyway, the very f f fact that she's there. They gave us a tremendous amount of moral support. Then when we were later transferred to Gila River, the internment camp there, uh, southeast of uh, Phoenix, it was very hot and dusty. Uh, she and her sister would come, and it was just amazing that, uh, uh, that she had that much dedication and care for us and would bring things that we, that we couldn't get in the camp that we needed. And, uh, and because they were traveling together, and it was uh, risky for the women to be out driving, 
one of them will always wear a man's hat. And so from the back, you see this man's hat. And so they would figure the woman's driving, he's sitting there. So anyway, I just had a great deal of uh, admiration for them and appreciation. And besides that, uh, she, she had a daughter and uh, her name was Madeline. And when I went to El Monte High School, the club I was in, I found out she, the daughter was our advisor. So it's uh, amazing, this chain of, of uh, really good fortune for me to uh, have this contact. So, well, in getting back to, uh, to uh, my childhood, and you know, we had all the, we had a far, uh, farm, so we had to work on the farm. And uh, I think if you ask my sister, she probably felt she had to carry quite a heavy burden being the only girl in the family. Uh, so, but anyway, uh, my, my father and my brother encouraged me to uh, participate in things at school. Mm -hmm. So I, I became a uh, uh, student leader in El Monte High School. I was uh, invited to join the, the special honorary service club called the Lions Choirs, and you had to be voted in. And I was voted in, and during my uh, second semester in junior year, I was the president of the club, and so uh, I felt that uh, there were certain things in me that uh, uh, made it uh, relatively easy uh, to become a leader. Mm -hmm. I, uh, you know, just fortunate people seemed to like me and, and they looked at me for ideas and things, so, okay. <laughs> Let me be president, I'll be president. <laughs> so after you guys had moved from Rosemead to El Monte, mm -hmm. uh, did your family continue to farm in El Monte? Yes, yes. We, we uh, had leased property in the northern part of El Monte. And uh, uh, this is where, you know, some of our neighbors were so good. And uh, one of the things that happened to me was uh, there was a banker who was lived not too far away from our farm. And he would uh, be called to go to certain conferences and, and would be out of town. And so he and his wife would attend these conferences, but his mother was living in the house. And so uh, he'd come over and ask if I would come over and just uh, stay the night and, and keep her company. And that wasn't hard. Uh, and besides, I was paid the whole 12 and a half cents an hour. <laughs> but uh, I got more than that out of it because uh, she was a very, very wise person, and uh, for a, I think I was either in eighth grade or ninth grade or so when this started, that uh, uh, um, I would go there to do my homework, and uh, then we would sit down and talk, and uh, uh, she uh, was a strong uh, Christian, and so she would tell me about uh, her life as a Christian and, and a little bit about the Bible and, and generally her own philosophy. And, and if I had any problems with things in school, she would give me some advice. So it was a very nice thing. And for a young person like myself, uh, someone who was around 50 seemed awfully old. So I, I don't know how old she was. She was probably in her 60s, but I thought she was really old. Mm -hmm. But uh, I called her M Mother Battles. Her, husband, her uh, son's name was Battles, so 
And uh, so it's amazing that uh, uh, what things that seem very uh, uh, natural or uh, uh, unimportant, sitting, you know, uh, for a grandmother, uh, turned out to be very uh, important in my life. I, I didn't know that, but uh, it gave me some background that uh, formed my my own philosophy and my path in in the spiritual world. So I think uh, I would have to give her credit for uh, introducing me to Christianity. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are others who picked that up afterwards, but uh, well, she was, I, I think, rather instrumental in my growth. I don't think she knew it either, but uh, she kept in contact with me. So whenever, you know, I was uh, interned and in the course of uh, trying to stay, straighten out our belongings here, we have almost 67 years of accumulation of things, that uh, we found these little books and they were addressed to me as birthday presents uh, when I was in Tulare and uh, when I was in, in the camp in Arizona. So uh, I thought that was uh, kind of a very nice reminder of Mother Battles who uh, played an important part in my life even though I don't think she realized it. Yeah. She thought I was helping her by just sitting there and making sure that uh, nothing happened to her. Mm -hmm. So anyway, so I was in uh, my seventh and eighth years in Columbia School in El Monte. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, I look with a great deal of pleasure too is that my Glee Club teacher, director, was uh, Paul Gardner and his, uh, he's a fine fellow, and uh, I would say my music and singing has gone downhill since, but at that time I was in the choir and I wasn't asked to just mouth the things, music, but actually sing. Uh, when I later became a faculty member uh, at, El at uh, Whittier High School, I discovered that uh, he was uh, in the district mm -hmm. working and he later became the district psychologist. So uh, it was a very nice thing. And then during my teaching, along comes his daughter and she becomes my, my student. So that's a nice little chain of events too. Mm -hmm. And also at uh, Columbia School and El Monte High School, uh, I made a lot of friends with my classmates. And uh, when I started teaching at Whittier High School, I noticed that uh, there's a fellow named Wally Leonard. And he was a tennis coach and a counselor. And he was my classmate in El Monte. So uh, uh, those things kind of helped me uh, uh, connect with my earlier life and, and there, it was nice to have a, a friend uh, when I started teaching. Now are you first generation American? Or? Well, I'm uh, what they call a second generation is uh, Nise means second. Mm -hmm. Nise is uh, the first generation are those who came from Japan. Yeah. So they, at that time, they were not eligible to be citizens. So they were uh, registered uh, aliens. And uh, so my father uh, was not an American citizen. But uh, I was born here, so I was a, an American citizen. But because I was a second uh, generation to come, first generation to be American, but yeah. second generation to be here, that, that we're called Nisei. Yeah. Right. 
Um, so aside from helping out on the farm, um, what what else would you do for work, and what what would you do for fun growing up? Well, you know, I was I was only in the seventh grade when I started there, so um, I just recall that uh, I tried to take part in as many school activities as I can because both my brother and my father encouraged me to do this. But in the, as a result, uh, probably more of the responsibility fell on the rest of the family. Uh, so uh, if you ask my sister, she probably would say that she did all the work. <laughs> so anyway, but we all got along. Uh, I, I just, you know, I went out for athletics. So I was on the track team at Del Monte High School and uh, made friends. I, uh, I, it was, uh, uh, to, to me, it was a very good experience mm -hmm. at Del Monte. Made a lot of good friends. So uh, when we were uh, whisked off, to go to this prison-like uh, camp, I was in the 11th grade, a junior in high school. My uh, history teacher told me, uh, don't worry, Yoshio. He says, the Constitution will uh, help you, you know, will protect you. Uh, at that time, there were rumors that we would be uh, put into camps. And, uh, but the, instructor didn't know that the Constitution can be sidetracked under the guise of military necessity. And so uh, he was surprised and disappointed that uh, when we were uh, ordered to leave, you know, report in Pasadena to board a train to go to our internment camps. So I, I'd say that uh, that's a, probably one of the traumatic experiences in my life is to be uprooted uh, because as a junior, you know, I was a, a student leader and looking forward to a really a fantastic senior year and to be whisked off is you know, just very disappointing. Uh, in this particular camp that we were in, Tulare, uh, one of my uh, very good friends, uh, Kenneth Morgan, uh, who's a neighbor and classmate, uh, came to visit me. And uh, when he saw the prison-like environment where we were not able to talk to each other in a room through a, a, you know, a window, uh, he was so shocked that uh, you're the, an innocent guy like me was put into this prison-like environment that he couldn't even talk about it for 30 years. It was just, it was just something that uh, if anyone asked, it was an emotional uh, thing. And so uh, it was like, it was with him and many of my friends that uh, I, f I felt that uh, in America will f discover that this uh, internment uh, was wrong, that there was a mistake. And uh, so they helped me maintain a pretty positive attitude that things are eventually going to be right. And there are others who uh, became rather bitter, and uh, you know, all I can say is, uh, if if you're angry, it doesn't matter to, at, at someone, uh, you can only harm yourself. That uh, eventually, it's best to just forgive these dumb things mm -hmm. and uh, mistakes that are made, mm -hmm. and uh, Lou Samparini is a track star at USC, Olympic champion, 
uh, was a prisoner of the Japanese, and he was really brutally uh, treated. And his life was very miserable when he got back. Uh, he, I think, was a drunkard and, and uh, uh, just resentful of all the things that happened to him until he found that forgiving all these things would free him. And that's what he did. And he, so much so, that he actually went over into Japan to meet the fellow who was torturing him to forgive him. And, uh, and he became a champion of, of uh, forgiveness uh, for, for the rest of his life. And he was uh, to be the Grand Marshal when we had our float, the, mm. the uh, Gopher Brook float. Uh, because uh, as an inspirational leader, uh, but he passed away. Mm. So I'd say that he was a very good role model in terms of forgiveness. And I, I think somewhere along the line, I, I learned that it's better to forgive people than to harbor hatred and resentment. You know, it just eats you inside. and. You're not hurting the person who really did harm to you. Yeah. You know they don't know that you're mad at them. You're, you know, you have evil things to think about. Uh, they're on to something else. So uh, I'd say that uh, that uh, in my life uh, has been perhaps one of the key things that uh, kept me. Uh, focused on positive things. Um, now, the day that, that Pearl Harbor was attacked, do you remember where you were? And Oh, yes. Uh, I believe uh, I was uh, picking raspberries, but I, I, I'm i not, not really sure. Uh, I was working on the farm, mm -hmm. and my neighbor came to me and said, did you hear about the bombing? And... Uh, no, I hadn't heard of it. So uh, uh, he told me about the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And it was, uh, well, my life changed right there because after all, uh, the people who bombed Pearl Harbor were Japanese and uh, I had a Japanese face. So uh, it was, uh, it's like, uh, uh, you know, you're a junior high, in high school and you come home and suddenly the family says, you're no longer a member of our family, you know? And so in a sense, uh, the events that followed made us feel like the country is deserting us. So I'd say that uh, that was a devastating thing. And uh, I thought, the bombing was not a very smart thing. It may have been a brilliant uh, preemptive strike. Um, and I have bought into the idea for a long time that it was a uh, surprise attack, sneak attack, you know, all these things that were uh, mentioned along with the attack. And if you think about it for a while, and see the distance from Pearl Harbor to Tokyo, and to think that no one was aware of all these ships, these aircraft carriers going <laughs> through the ocean towards uh, uh, Hawaii. Uh, I, I think that people who did see them uh, may perhaps may have reported and, and Oh, no one's going to be that, that dumb. I mean, there, there, no one's going to be <laughs> going across the ocean like that. And so uh, there were just a lot of errors that were made. Uh, first of all, the ships were in dock. 
And the people who were manning these ships and having a party, I mean, the, <laughs> there were, I mean, all these people were enjoying life at uh, in Pearl Harbor. And well, of course, there were men on, on the ship as well. So uh, the uh, fact that they were so successful in bombing so many ships, uh, it, it was a very devastating thing. And it, it, what happened to the people in our country is that prior to that, there was no interest or very little interest in joining the war in Europe. In fact, we didn't even help the refugees, the German Jews who wanted to come to the United States. Uh, we just had zero interest in entering a war. And then, of course, the bombing just suddenly, the, you know, people got uh, very fired up to uh, fight back. So I think what happened was that uh, the bombing was like chopping the tail off of a tiger. And then the tiger wakes up and uh, will attack. So uh, I think that the, the United States had tremendous resources. Japan is a little island had very little resources. And to think that from a military standpoint that they could conquer a large country like the United States. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, you have to realize that some people in the military think that all these things can be done mm -hmm. by force alone. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, I, I think the people who planned the attack uh, may have had second thoughts when <laughs> they woke up the sleeping giant. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's that's uh, life turned upside down for us. In fact, uh, uh, the late Senator Daniel E. Noe, uh was a member of the 442nd. He won the Congressional Medal of Honor. That's given to an individual who had done particularly heroic things in the war. He was classified 4C when he was 18. 4C is enemy alien. So you can imagine then how the Nisei felt that uh, all of a sudden you're classified 4C, and therefore you're ineligible to volunteer for the armed forces. Now many men, many, many people in Hawaii, after the attack, wanted to join the armed forces, and they were not allowed to join. So, uh, and then there was a tremendous amount of propaganda the, about the treacherous nature of the Japanese and all this, they painted in such a way. One of the terrible things about war is that you can't paint your enemy uh, kindly. Uh, you use the, the most awful things you can think of. Well, unfortunately, the awful things that people can think of was painted on us as well. So, you know, there were rumors that were taken as news. I recall that uh, one rumor was that the cane fields were shaped in this arrow pointing to the uh, Pearl Harbor. Well, that was just fabricated. It was just, and all kinds of things, like uh, a neighbor had the porch lights on at night during your curfew. You just forgot to turn it off. They're signaling submarines, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, 
So there were just all kinds of rumors, and the, the, the most terrible kind you can think of were broadcast and decimated, uh, you know, uh, put in print by the newspapers, talked about by politicians, uh, just painted with the same brush. So uh, there was, uh, in a sense, a popular or um, uh, sentiment that uh, we're very dangerous. Uh, when uh, we <coughs> finally had to uh, um, succumb to the Executive Order 9066, which was signed by President Roosevelt, uh, General John DeWitt was the commander of the Western Defense Command. When he was told that the Japanese Americans had done no wrong. Well, he said, that's the very reason we should uh, get them out of the Pacific Coast, because they might cause, might uh, commit sabotage. And it's like, you know, you drove here probably, and while you're driving, if the police pulled you aside and then took you into jail, and you'd say, well, why am I in jail? You might kill someone with that car, so we we're going to put you in jail. And that's what happened. And so uh, all these things uh, caused the uh, uh, politicians who, who wanted to be re elected, uh, they thought they would be more popular if they just added on more fuel to this thing. The newspapers, uh, the first papers especially, took all these rumors and, mm, you know, made them even worse. And, and commentators, I mean, people who are supposed to be knowledgeable, investigating, they took these rumors and passed them on. So it's no wonder that the population Hearing all these things, and not, and a few people saying, "Hey, look, that's not right. That's not what's happening." They couldn't be heard because of this loud voice coming out from everywhere, saying that these people are treacherous, and just liable to do anything that will harm the United States. Now, in, in your experience, were you treated differently from classmates and, and people that you... Uh, well, I would say that uh, uh, at El Monte High School, they uh, were very supportive. And they uh, treated us well. There were others who didn't know us. I mean, uh, they, they, uh, I think they thought of us as... Uh, equal to the those of the enemy, but by and large, uh, El Monte, the my schoolmates, uh, were very supportive. In fact, one of my friends uh, was asked by a reporter, "Well, what did you do when uh, you found out that the Japanese Americans had to be uh, put into these camps and they were removed from the school?" And he said. We just went on the lawn and cried. So there wasn't anything they could do to help us. And, uh, so uh, I would say that those kinds of things uh, kept my hope alive that uh, eventually these lies would uh, be seen in the, in the true light. That uh, actually uh, there was a Congressional and Presidential Commission that studied the incarceration of Americans during World War II. And after hearing a lot of testimony all over the country, they concluded that the incarceration 
was not based on military necessity, but on his war hysteria, racial prejudice, and the failure of political leadership. Because at that time, uh, if, if you wanted to be uh, elected, uh, if you were in any way sympathetic to the flights of us Americans of Japanese ancestry, the chances are uh, you may not have been elected. Because of all this propaganda, uh, the, the Germans were very good in propaganda, but I think we outdid them <laughs> with their just basically all lies and uh, were uh, treated as news and the truth. So anyway, that uh, commission's study uh, resulted in an apology by the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House of Representatives, our Congress, and it was signed by President uh, Ronald Reagan. That was in 1988. And at that time, uh, when he signed the thing, he said, fellow Americans, let me uh, try to correct a serious wrong. Let me sign H.R. 442, and that is the apology uh, for the incarceration of Japanese Americans. And it really takes a great country to, first of all, admit that they were wrong and, uh, and to apologize for it. And, to, and there was a small bit of compensation for all of the survivors of that incarceration. The, uh, there are many of us who felt that uh, there shouldn't be any monetary uh, compensation. Uh, that isn't the real uh, thing that would help us. Uh, but knowing what, uh, the, you know, we believe in capitalism, and that money talks, and that if you, uh, if there is some consequence of doing something wrong, money consequences, then people may think twice. So if you did something wrong, and there would be thousands, maybe millions of dollars involved, uh, you would think, oh, wait, wait a minute, let's think it over. But if it's only a piece of paper that says we're sorry, it may not be enough. So that's why I thought that the compensation was a good idea. That uh, in the future, if any president, if any political leader, if anyone uh, wanted to do something wrong, uh, they would know that there would be some consequences. So set a, a precedent for yes. the future. And we see that uh, we don't want to see this uh, history repeat itself. Right. So I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm very much in favor of uh, not blaming innocent people for what they believe in their God or what they look like or where their parents came from or whom they love or, or whatever. It, you know, if they're innocent, uh, don't blame them for something, you know, something else. And uh, It's always dangerous when you blame an entire group yes. uh, for the actions of, yes. of a few. Well, in this case, you see, I don't think that even the ambassador of Japan knew that this attack was going to take place. Certainly, no Japanese American knew anything about it. And the Japanese nationals who were living here knew anything about it. I don't think anyone knew that this attack was going to take place. And so, uh, but then we were given credit for that, you see, after the attack, that uh, somehow we encouraged this to happen. And so, uh, 
and it, it was not a easy thing to uh, dismiss because there was nothing else to base it on. You see, unfortunately, uh, if there is war hysteria, you scare people enough, they'll believe just about anything. And I think that's what happened. At any point, did you feel conflicted um, about your, your heritage and your nationality? And um, I, I know you were sort of guilt, guilty by association um, in the eyes of... Uh, well, yes, I, I, I was aware that uh, we were guilty by association. Uh, we were completely innocent. But because the people who bombed Pearl Harbor looked like us, that uh, uh, certainly uh, I, I recall some of the people I've met in the 442nd uh, Regiment who came from Hawaii. When they saw the planes coming over and they saw the pilots and they looked like him, you know, they looked Japanese. He said his world went upside down. So he said he knew, you know, the world was uh, very different after that. So uh, I think the German people uh, during World War I uh, living in the United States felt the same kind of uh, hatred and uh, so it's, it's an unfortunate thing that uh, sometimes uh, people who had something go wrong outside, you know, someone kicked them, did something wrong, and, and, and this person couldn't get back to them. So when he gets in the house, he kicks a dog, you see, or he takes it out on his kids or something. It's like... Uh, they're finding a scapegoat. Yeah. So we became scapegoats that uh, made them feel good that they can punish someone, you see, even though the punished person didn't deserve it. Yeah. So, uh, that, that's an unfortunate thing. And um, I was uh, just uh, encouraged and uh, really very happy that the Congress of the United States realized that that was a mistake. And so it's a, it's a country saying, we're sorry we did this. And it was done, and not much we can do about what was done in the past to, you know, to admit that it was wrong and to try to rectify it in some way. So can you take me through the experience of um, when you were notified that your family would have to leave and um, when you actually vacated your home and... Okay. Well, uh, <clears throat> if you can imagine, uh, these notices were put on telephone poles and a lot of public places, post offices, a big notice saying, uh, all people of Japanese descent, citizen or non, non, uh, non alien or non alien, or to report such and such, and it outlined the area in which uh, this notice uh, applied to, and uh, so you know, we saw these notices, and and it included the territory in which I lived, so. And at a particular day, we were to report to Pasadena uh, to uh, be put into one of these camps. So uh, I don't recall just how much time we had. It seemed like about two weeks, but it wasn't very much time. So we had to uh, take care of the equipment we had. We had a horse, we had a truck. Uh, we had other farm equipment and, you know, household items and 
Uh, we had crops on the ground, just, you know, a lot of things. So uh, we had to sell some things. I just, uh, it was the buyer's market at that time. And uh, in fact, uh, there was a, a uh, Mexican-American student in Los Angeles who was so upset about the treatment of Japanese Americans by people who came to buy, you know, the, their lawnmowers and all other things. And one, uh, he happened to come across this one fellow who was laughing because he was able to get this lawnmower for two dollars or something. Ha <laughs> ha, you know, I got these for two dollars. And it just made him so upset that he himself joined the family and went to Manzanar and <laughs> he in turn and and uh, at that particular time if you if you said you know I'm Japanese you know I'm, I'm a Japanese ancestry they won't question you you're in camp so uh, anyway uh, but he uh, was a strong advocate for Japanese Americans. And he was a popular in, in his high school. And someone my wife knew, his name was Ralph Lazo. So uh, we get back to what I had to do. We had to dispose of all these things. And, uh, and probably the worst thing we had to do was uh, get, we had to find a place for our dog because he was, you know, a very part part of the family in a sense. But we had a I mean a horse that we liked too and and uh, so we had to get rid of all these things. And uh, Mrs. Paul, the, the first grade teacher I talked about, uh, volunteered to take some uh, items that we couldn't carry with us, uh, items that my mother had, big dishes and different things like that. So she stored them for us uh, for the duration. Uh, but otherwise, they were either sold or given away or just left. Uh, the crops had to be just left. I mean, it wasn't time enough to pick everything. And things. So uh, it was a very, very trying time. And uh, one of my neighbors, Again, it was Kenneth Morgan. Uh, took me to, took us to uh, Pasadena on the train station, and then we were loaded up and went to, to Tulare, which is in Central California. When we got off the train, um, all these soldiers were along the street with rifles and fixed bayonets. And uh, there were people from Tulare along the street watching this on spectacle of uh, frightened children, women and children, uh, and men getting off of the train and going towards the Tulare racetrack. We had to walk from the train station to the racetrack. I, I was there a few years ago with my wife to show her where the train station was and where we had to walk, and it was some distance. And I can still hear, you know, some voices and uh, children, and one child saying, you know, mommy, where are we going? And why are these men, why do they have guns? And, but, uh, we were escorted to the train, to the uh, racetrack. When we got there, we discovered that the, the whole racetrack was uh, surrounded with barbed wire, and there were guard towers spaced all around with searchlights, and there were sentry uh, soldiers up there and with guns. Some of them fixed, you know, machine guns fixed. And uh, we were told that uh, those are 
you know, we this is for your protection, so the people outside aren't going to harm you. But we looked up and we saw that the searchlights were pointed inward, and the machine guns were pointed inward. And the soldiers were looking inward, not outside. So, uh, uh, you know, they thought we would buy this uh, euphemistic thing. Uh, saying it was for our protection. And this is when, you know, I mentioned that my friend came to visit me and uh, was just, was just horrified. We uh, had to be in these uh, horse stalls. They're, they boarded up the horse stalls into little partitions and, and uh, put asphalt on the ground and uh, those were our living quarters. Each family had a little spot. And I would say that for many reasons, it was a stinky kind of prison. So uh, that, that's what I, I can say about it. Uh, the uh, life was, you know, in this confined area and being young, uh, we just decided that uh, we'll make the most of it. So we, uh, you know, we'd sit around, talk, and, and people who had certain kinds of skills would offer classes, uh, have discussion groups. Um, Hand music, you know, they had played uh, phonographs and things like that. That's about all I can remember. Is that it was a, uh, a stockade. It kind of reminded me later on when I was a soldier in uh, Italy when we captured German soldiers and put them in the stockades. And we had, you know, uh, wires around. We had guard towers, and uh, and we and then our guns were <laughs> faced inward with the prisoners inside. But uh, but that experience as a soldier reminded me what it was like being the prisoner. You see. So when was your family uh, forced to leave? What what month? Uh, I believe it was May. May of 40, 42? 42. And what were, you, what were you guys able to bring with you? Well, we were able to bring what we can carry. And then we had a few things that they could load on a truck. But most of the things we had to carry ourselves. So we're not allowed to take anything that could possibly be used as a weapon. So no knives, you know anything that, and uh, any instruments that might be used for communication. Uh, we were actually just stripped of anything that might make us comfortable, you know. Uh, my wife re still remembers uh, a family, I think there were three, crying children, the father with a backpack full of diapers, carrying a suitcase, and a baby crying, you know, you know, a girl, and the mother with all these blankets and things, and carrying what she could, and, and trying to hold a couple of children who were crying too. And she said, she, that image has just haunted her for I mean, it still haunts her. She's not with us anymore, but it really has haunted her. Uh, another thing that might uh, be interesting to you is that uh, the Franklin Roosevelt Museum in New York had a photo exhibit of life in the camps. And it was uh, an exhibit of uh, photographs taken by uh, 
people who were in camp and uh, uh, preserved by a family and later the family was uh, honored by the Washington State University, I think, as an, like an honorary alumnus, uh, alumna. Anyway, there is a description of life in the camps. And on the top line was a quote from my late wife and my uh, former pastor's wife and he were traveling in New York and they stopped at this museum and they saw this uh, uh, sign and uh, she sent me the, the picture of it and it was so uh, uh, powerful. All she said was she was on a bus going to Manzanar and they arrived in Manzanar in the dusk and so when the bus stopped she said, the people looked out and saw this tar paper city and there was complete silence. And that's all that said there. And then it tells about the life in the camps. So uh, it, it uh, you know, environmentally, it certainly was not a friendly place. Yeah. And can you just tell me how much time you spent in Tulare uh, before okay. you guys were moved in to Arizona? In Tulare, I was uh, there from uh, May uh, to, I think it was September. Mm -hmm. And we were transported from there to the Gila River uh, internment camp. There were two camps there. I was in the larger one called Butte. B-U-T-T-E, because there was a butte next to the camp. And how long, how much time did you spend there? Well, I was there until uh, I was in the service. Mm -hmm. uh, I should mention that uh, uh, when I uh, had to answer some questions, and one of them uh, they were called loyalty questions, a questionnaire. One was, would I forego allegiance to the Emperor of Japan? And that's a, a, one of the worst questions you can ask, because if you answered yes, that means you uh, were, uh, you know, you held allegiance to Japan mm -hmm. and the Emperor. If you answered no, it mean, meant that I forego, that I was. And so uh, it, it was a question that you, you couldn't really answer in the right. I mean, the wrong, every answer was wrong. You were set up for failure in a, in yes. a sense. But uh, I figured that the people who worked out the questionnaire, if you answered yes, uh, you were loyal, you see. So if you answered no, you, you were disloyal. So I figured I'll just answer yes. And then the other question was, will you serve, here we are in enclosed in this camp with the century towers and, and you know, locked up. Will you serve in the armed forces of the, of the United States and go anywhere ordered? And when I answered yes, I felt, yes, I'm, it's like volunteering, that yes, I will serve. And uh, so I was put into the uh, enlisted reserve. But before that happened, uh, I was uh, fortunate enough that uh, one of my friends, who was an older person in camp, had uh, been relocated to Des Moines, Iowa. And he came in and he said, uh, why don't you come back with me and I'll sponsor you. And so I thought it would be just a good idea for me to know 
what life was like outside of the camp for a few weeks. And uh, so I went with him and that's when I was inducted into the service at Fort Des Moines, Iowa. And that's where they put me into the enlisted reserve. So I was there for a while and then uh, I knew that I would have to report for active duty I returned to camp with my to be with my family. Mm -hmm. So that is where I was I left Gila River Camp to go to Fort Lucas, Utah to be inducted. And uh, or in, to report for active duty. And there from there I went to Camp Landing, Florida for basic training. And from there to Fort Meade, Maryland, uh, to disembark uh, to go to Europe. But Paul and Fort Meade, uh, someone in our replacement group, uh, Nisa soldiers, got measles. And then a second person got measles. And then a third person got measles. So every day we had to report show our backs and our butts and uh, the officer was saying, go to the hospital, go back to the barracks. And so uh, we were quarantined until all the people who were eligible to <laughs> get measles, got measles, and uh, until everyone who was going to get measles got it and then was cured. And so it uh, delayed our uh, uh, overseas uh, trip for a while. But eventually we did get, uh, uh, you know, we were cleared. But uh, one of the things that happened that uh, was uh, humorous and, 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 uh, and also uh, something that I admired about the person in charge, it was a woman uh, officer who was in charge of our barrack. I think she was a nurse, but anyway, she was an officer. And when you have measles, sometimes you, you're not very sick. You just have bumps, uh, you're itchy. So, you know, we're, we're all out talking and, and uh, some guys were playing, you know, cards and others are, you know, all, singing and doing all kinds of things. And this officer came into the barracks and saw that these men were out of their bunks. And she decided she's not gonna have any of that. So she ordered us all back into the bunks. And just to remind you, I'm an officer and I'm ordering you into your bunks. Then. Then she said, I want you to remove the bottom of your pajamas. Oh. And hang them up on the your bed, you know. Or your your cots. Okay. I want you to stay there. And she said, If any of you get out, you are going to be court martialed for indecent exposure to an officer. <laughs> so, so we obeyed her, and uh, uh, the rest of the time we uh, we were good soldiers, not having as as good of a time as we wanted to have, because we we're not really that sick, except that we were itchy, and we were contagious. So. Uh, until this was all over, the quarantine was over, then we were uh, transported to Nyack, New York. And uh, from there, we were to board ships to go to Europe. But uh, we visited Nyack later, my wife and I, to see what the town was like, because I had really good visions of people who were very kind, the USO had coffee and, and uh, refreshments for us and uh, they treated us very well while 
before we went overseas. Mm -hmm. And we found that gee, it wasn't quite as idyllic as I thought. You know, <laughs> just an ordinary town. <laughs> but anyway, we we were there, and and uh, I, I thought the, I just have a very high opinion of the USO uh, really helping uh, soldiers out in the country and uh, overseas. So we finally uh, were ordered to report for uh, the shipment overseas. And when I saw the ship, I, I was already seasick because uh, some of the men were able to go on these huge liners, but uh, this one, I think it was called a Liberty ship, or anyway, it was a very tiny uh, troop transport. At least in my eyes, it looked very small. And uh, so just before I even got on, I felt boozy. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and one of the instructions when we got on board was uh, we, we realized it's a small ship and some of you are going to be down below. And if you need to uh, throw up, go on board and feed the fish. He said, don't do it here. <laughs> so uh, I obeyed those orders. I'm sure I fed quite a few fish. For a while, uh, those of us who get seasick, uh, are afraid that, that we will get really sick. And then later on, you're afraid you're going to be sick and you won't die. <laughs> so uh, I would say it was a miserable trip to France. And uh, when we got off the ship, and again, uh, the USO was there. And uh, I recall some uh, very nice hot coffee and the, there were some GIs helping it and the coffee was made in these big tubs with the coffee beans inside. I mean they didn't grind it, they just made it out of the whole bean <laughs> and they just cooked it and cooked it and cooked it. So it was tasted very good and when we were on these uh, uh, we got off and we were put on these uh, uh, cattle cars. In Europe, the, the cars are smaller and they're not as well cushioned. I mean, you can feel every bump that, you know, where the train tracks are joined together, you hear this clickety clack. Well, you can feel it as you go along. But we were put in cattle cars because uh, there was a need to hide movement of troops and there was no, apparently no suspicion that troops were in these cattle cars. So we were transported to southern France and that's where I was assigned to the 442nd Regiment and we engaged in some combat there. There was uh, all I can remember is that one day I was assigned in one place and another day I was assigned somewhere else and you know, all kinds of things. And uh, So we were there for a while. I, I don't recall just how long, for a while, until we got a, a request from uh, General Mark Clark of the Fifth Army in Italy excuse me, to uh, uh, help break the Gothic line. Mark Clark uh, was in charge when the 442nd was in Italy, and then they were requested to go to France to rescue this lost battalion. And now he's asked us back, and uh, we were to help break the Gothic line. The Gothic line stood still for about six months because 
the German observation posts were up on Monfogarito and other uh, high mountain peaks. And so every time the forces tried to move north, shells would come down and stop them. Uh, for six months, this happened. Then uh, uh, we were asked to knock out these outposts, but we were to do this in total darkness. So uh, we had to go on these narrow paths with fascists, uh, these uh, partisans who were anti-fascist leading the way. They happened to know this pathway very well. So in the total darkness, we were climbing up. And I think I told you that uh, about the attack going, uh, falling over on the side, oh, air side instead of the cliff. Well, we finally made it to the top by daybreak and were able to surprise the enemy outpost. And we knocked them out so fast that uh, we became a major force in breaking the, the Gothic line, as well as the forces in the, in the Po Valley. There were many more troops in the Po Valley going north, but we were able to capture so many of the soldiers. Uh, they had fortunately run out of ammunition, or they were short on ammunition, and they many of the people we captured said, we saw you, but we didn't have anything to shoot you with. <laughs> and we said, gee, that's too bad. <laughs> so anyway, well, we went advanced all the way up to Genoa. So, uh, and there was a big celebration in, in Genoa uh, of, of the liberation of the, the city and uh, parades. And they actually had some uh, Nazi fascist sympathizers, uh, women, uh, they took their, cut their hairs off, hair off, and, uh, you know, they were kind of disgraced in front of all the people. So, uh, but the anti-fascists were so happy that uh, they were free of the, the fascist rule, and the war was over. You know, by then, uh, Germany had, uh, and Italy had surrendered. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was good. And, and uh, a lot of our work after that was taking prisoners who gave up. We had to take their weapons and anything that might be used as a weapon and put them into these uh, compounds that we set up to house them. I recall that uh, the prisoners weren't as bad as the, the pictures that we were made of them, you know, Nazi, uh, torturers and all this, uh, they behaved pretty much, pretty much like us. Uh, they, they would have musicals, you know, and, and they would ask us, uh, we're guarding them, why don't you come and join us, you know, and sing. Or, and, uh, well, at that time, I, my voice wasn't exactly suitable for singing, so anyway, it was it was nice in that sense that uh, that we were able to uh, take care of these prisoners, but we didn't have to torture them. That they were fed and uh, eventually released to uh, Germany. Now that that climb um, up the mountain, do you know about? How long that took you guys? I mean, well, that's a little foggy. I know there were several weeks of fighting there, and uh, before you guys made the ascent. Well, 
Yes, well, it took us a while to get down where we had to start the descent. So we went from uh, the port of Leghorn to through Pisa, and uh, as I recall, we saw the Leaning Tower of Pisa, and then to Carrara, which is the marble capital of the world. At the time, there was still a mining marble that's, uh, the place is rich with very, very fine marble. So the marble would be sliced and then sent to, to different places. And f so it was Pretasante, Pietrasante, and then Carrara, and then winding our, through, our way through to the foot of Mount Fulvorito and climbing it. It was just pitch black, so that's, and I don't recall precisely of the timing there. It just seemed, it took oh, quite a while to get through, and, uh, and it took us a whole, uh, I think a whole night to climb up the top of Mount Fulgarito. Mm -hmm. Do you know about the elevation? I, I, I wish I could tell you. Mm -hmm. I probably could look it up. But it, it, it's so much higher than Po Valley, which was down here. Mm -hmm. And it was so steep on this side that uh, it, it was, I think even in daylight it would be dangerous to mm -hmm. climb. But at night, maybe it was fortunate we couldn't see yep. how steep it was if you fell off. Could have, yeah, could have been an advantage. Yeah, so, but I understand there are people who fell off climbing the mountain, and, you know, they couldn't yell or anything, I mean, give our position away. So, it was a, it just too bad. Now, um, you were an ammo carrier on a mortar team. Mm -hmm. um, what exactly would you carry on you? How much of it? Well, I, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, but I, I imagine it probably weighed around 40 pounds. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't recall how many, I think four rounds. Was, they're about that big, and do you know what a mortar is? Mm -hmm. and it, it, you know, you can, someone carried the mortar, uh, the cylinder, and then Tech carried the base plate. And then the cylinder is placed in on the pl base plate, and the cylinder has a little pin inside. And so you take the shell and and someone aims it at a particular target and you push this in and it goes down this tube and the pin sets off the explosion and the motor goes up and uh, so the person who, who aims it has to calculate the how high it will go and where it will go. So th that's uh, the mortar shells, you know, go up high enough so that it passes over the, our troops and to the next, you know, far beyond. Mm -hmm. So once, once uh, I guess you exhausted all the rounds that you were carrying, you'd have to to well, run and get more. There'd be others carrying and, uh, rounds behind me, mm -hmm. and uh, there would be others. There would be. Uh, other replacement of, of equipment and rounds of ammunition uh, streaming in. So, uh, did you also carry a rifle or any? Yes, I had a, a carbon, which is a small rifle, in case uh, you know an enemy soldier starts to fire at you, and then you have to fire back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we had to carry a canteen and, 
you know, a lot of other things with us. Uh, if uh, there was a little shovel on the, or that in case you need to make a foxhole. Uh, so those, it, it was heavy stuff, especially for a 109 weight fellow. <laughs> Did you experience any, any close calls? Well, uh, I remember that uh, we were in in a uh, building, and uh, the uh, a shell hit the building, and so I I know that there, yeah, there the shells uh, were aimed at us, and uh, fortunately it, it didn't land on us, you know, but we're aware that it, it hit buildings and the ground near us. As I said, I, I was very fortunate that by the time I got there, uh, the, the really heavy fighting uh, sustained, you know, battles. Uh, those were over, and we, although we were part of a major offensive that uh, many that went before us paved the way. And you received uh, a bronze star for your service? Yes. Um, three battle stars? Mm -hmm and uh, recently the, the French Legion of, of Honor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And your unit uh, also received um, multiple presidential unit citations. Mm -hmm. At the end, of the, after the war ended and uh, uh, the soldiers were eligible to go home, uh, a major portion of the 442nd Regiment uh, was allowed to go home. So they were summoned to the White House. I was still in Italy. The, the old timers, the people who were there for a long time, were, went home with, with the unit and uh, summoned to the White House. So on the White House gr grounds, the 442nd Regiment was there, and President Harry Truman uh, commanded the troops, the Japanese American troops. And what he said then was, you not only fought the enemy, but you fought prejudice and you won. And that's, that's what he said. So I thought that was very significant that uh, you know, the President of the United States recognized the work of the Japanese American soldiers. Um. <clears throat> now you volunteered to, to defend your country, yeah. your, your home country, but yeah. the same country that was um, imprisoning, yes. imprisoning you. Yeah. Um, as you went away to fight the war, and you're fighting uh, against the enemy, which is Germany, did you did you at all feel like you were you were fighting uh, for your family back home at the same time to um, well, restore? Well, I think we, uh, I would say most of us felt that uh, uh, it was very important for us to be there and to show that. Uh, we were loyal to the United States, mm -hmm. and, uh, and the people who were in the service with me were pretty brave fellows, and and uh, they they don't would like to live, but they would uh, give their life if it's necessary. You see, so I, I'd say that. Uh, uh, there was more than the usual motivation of a soldier to win a battle, but uh, you're also 
uh, winning a battle for your family, uh, other people who were wrongfully in prison, and uh, uh, and for your own name, you know, yeah. just to uh, prove that you were loyal to the country. And after the war had ended, and and you eventually returned home to California. Mm -hmm. Well, I, what happened is I uh, I was discharged in Fort uh, Sheridan in Illinois, and then uh, at that particular time, uh, my brother and my family, uh, my father and my two brothers, were living in Nebraska. So I went there and uh, eventually came back to California. And there was a short time when, because of uh, a disability I got in, in Italy, I was in a uh, hospital, in a Veterans Administration hospital for a while. And from there, given all kinds of tests for uh, vocations and things, and uh, the Veterans Administration the personnel uh, suggested that uh, I would be, I, I could go into art, I could go into teaching, I could become a social worker. And there are several things that my, uh, the test showed uh, I had good inclinations for, talent for. So uh, I was able to enroll in USC, uh, pursue a, an art career, and uh, also at the same time uh, get a credential so that I could teach. And so that's what happened. I, I finished my bachelor's degree and uh, started on my master's degree and uh, my teaching credential uh, during my senior year, uh, the, I had enough units so that I could work in that direction. And so uh, I graduated in summer of 19, well, spring of 1940, uh, 52. Yes. Uh, at, the at the end of the spring semester in 1952. And uh, I also did a semester of student teaching during that time. And fortunately, I had a very good uh, uh, master teacher and uh, was at Fremont High School in Los Angeles. Uh, the woman was uh, Mary McGee. She was a former hostess uh, for the airlines. So she was uh, not only a good teacher, but she was an attractive teacher. And she uh, was very good to me. Then uh, in order for me to finish my teaching credential, I needed one more semester of student teaching. And USC didn't offer it uh, that summer. So I went to US, UCLA to see if I can enter their program uh, for teaching, uh, for student teaching. Uh, Dr. Vaughn was the uh, person in charge of the education program, the teacher training program. And uh, he looked over my records and things, and he said to me, normally uh, we don't take transfers from USC, but he said, I see that uh, uh, you come with good credentials. He said, uh, besides being at USC, you know, having been in the service, having been interned, he said, uh, I think we'll accept you. So I did my student teaching 
at Emerson Junior High School and uh, had a very fine teacher there too. And so uh, that was a, it was kind of a training school for UCLA students. And uh, so I got my credential and uh, while I was doing student teaching, I also was searching for a job. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were faculty members, faculty committees, and administrative committees in schools that wanted me for to be a teacher there, but they were afraid that the board of trustees would not uh, look kindly upon a person of Japanese ancestry. So I, this happened in several places until I went to Whittier, uh, the Whittier Union High School District and uh, applied. And the superintendent of the high school district was Herbert Winterberg. He was a trustee of the University of Redlands. And my wife had graduated from the University of Redlands in 1949. So in the course of our conversation, uh, he discovered that my wife had graduated from Redlands, and he was a, a trustee there, and he thought uh, I should be given a chance. So he uh, uh, let me, let my application go on to Whittier High School, and the principal there and the committee uh, looked at my credentials, and they liked it, and, and the principal happened to be a watercolorist as well as a principal. Uh, he was stationed in England and did some watercolors there. He was uh, uh, quite impressed with English watercolorists and painters. And, and so uh, right away there was a nice connection. And so they hired me and I was uh, treated very well. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I taught there for 11 years. Uh, I think I was the first teacher of the year uh, in that district because uh, they didn't have a system within the school district for that as they do now. Uh, but the Whittier Women's Club uh, had a program for a teacher of the year. Mm -hmm. So they interviewed to put a few people and I was selected and then I was uh, a candidate for a teacher of the year for San Gabriel Valley and I made that. Then I was uh, nominated for the teacher of the year for the state. Uh, I, I didn't quite make that one but the person who made it was an outstanding teacher so but it was a very good experience uh, because all the way I, uh, I gave speeches and you know people got to know me and, uh, and it, the uh, the honor uh, you know was was good and, and it made me feel that uh, you know my teaching was appreciated and uh, I've had a lot of very fine students. And I would say that uh, I give credit to my very fine students for encouraging me to become a better teacher. And so, and my colleagues also, they're, they're all at, at Whittier High School, they, they liked me pretty well. I was president of the teachers club. And so uh, it was a very good experience. I became a teacher and then I became a chairman of the department which included uh, uh, not only art but uh, music and theater. And that was a good experience. And from there, when Rio Hondo College opened uh, for classes, uh, they were contemplating classes. Uh, they were then hiring 
first they hired the president of the college, and then they hired the vice president and a few other people. And I was lucky that I was chosen as a faculty member and department chairman of a, a college that didn't exist <laughs> in the making. There were only 12 of us who were full-time people, including the president, when I was hired. And uh, so uh, uh, faculty meetings or meetings of the staff was with 12 people, with the president, and he was a, just a terrific fellow. And well, I, I, I just been very lucky all the way. I mean, I got to have a, a great deal to say about who is going to be hired in our department and uh, how the program was going to go. Uh, work with the architect on the planning of the college campus, uh, which is on Workman Mill now. Uh, it was just a tremendous experience. Uh, can I ask you about uh, the reunion with your, your father, your family, after you returned home from Europe? Yeah, well, I, uh, it was really very nice to see my father and my sister and brother brothers. I would say that uh, one of the tragic things about the evacuation and the internment was that my father uh, was always, uh, he prided himself that he could, you know, take care of us and provide for us. And here he was put into camp and, and all the authority of being a parent and everything was sort of taken away as by, you know, this big administration of the camp. And uh, that was a blow to him from a psychological standpoint. And then uh, he would have nightmares. And one night he fell from his cot under this rough uh, asphalt floor and uh, injured the whole side of his body. And it did more than just injure his body. It just seemed that it just took the life out of him, you know. So he uh, just needed uh, care after that. And fortunately for my, for him, and for me, was that both my younger brother and my sister uh, just took over. You know, they would bring meals to him and, you know, things like that. And uh, when I was in the Army, uh, they, they took, you know, uh, he wasn't uh, well enough to go to the mess hall, they called, to eat. And I think my brother or sister would bring the meals to him. So uh, it was nice to see him, but he was just, uh, shadow of what he was before the internment. And it was, it was really my, my older brother who I had a great deal of respect for and love for, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, it's just terrific to see them. But we were, uh, we wanted to return to California, so that's, it was a long time before quite a few weeks and months before that took place. And uh, while I was in the hospital, uh, my father passed away in Nebraska. Mm -hmm. So after that, they, my, my sister and brother came out. My, my older brother was with me here. So, uh, and that's when we were able to be a family for a while while I was going to school. What were you hospitalized for? Well, I had an infection in uh, my lungs, and a, uh, uh, it, was, it was service connected. It was determined by the Veterans Hospital, vet, Veterans Administration doctors, and, and so uh, I had to recuperate there, but I, I, I've been in very good shape since, and 
I, I have uh, one big advantage in that because I was hospitalized that, uh, uh, and I have a record of being cared for by the Veterans Administration, that if in the future I ever need to be in a hospital, that I would have an edge uh, of doing this. I also have a disability uh, with my hearing, and that was uh, determined to be service-connected. So, uh, aside from the fact that I'm a part of the Kaiser Health Plan, if for some reason that uh, I needed more help, that I could still uh, look to the Veterans Administration. I, I go in for yearly checkups uh, since 1947 and uh, I've been in good health. Uh, I, I would say that uh, I've just been very fortunate. After all, I'm 93, I'll be 94 uh, in June, so uh, the, uh, I think I, I, I look upon myself as being very, very fortunate to, even though some of the things I would like to have changed if I could, because of circumstances, I, I couldn't change my ethnicity I mean, I am, I'm a Japanese American, uh, but I'm very comfortable with the fact that I am, because I'm very proud of the fact that uh, the Japanese Americans were loyal to the country. They, even those who answered no to serving, uh, had a very good reason. It wasn't because they were disloyal, it's because they felt that, why should I serve a you know, when I am in jail. You know, it's asking a uh, prisoner uh, to be a cop, uh, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, I'd say that uh, by and large, the, all along my, my path of my life, that the people have just come in, uh, filled in where there were gaps and, and uh, uh, maintain a very optimistic viewpoint on life, and I still have that. And I, I feel very fortunate, and I know that uh, as a senior citizen, uh, there are several things you really should do, and one is to keep yourself physically healthy and mentally healthy, and one of the ways of doing it is being connected with other people and I have a very good relationship with my family and an extended family and a great group of people at church and my my fellow veterans and all the people who want to help us uh, they can't do enough actually they they have meetings where they they do it for us and they're having potlucks and they don't want us to bring anything. Just come and eat. <laughs> so uh, I, it's not too hard to not disappoint them. Uh, but I'm a part of, uh, you know, I was part of uh, the high school district. And even though I left there to go to Rio Hondo uh, College, the uh, Whittier High School Alumni Association uh, put me in their uh, Hall of Fame uh, as an instructor. And there were very few instructors who were given this Hall of Fame designation because uh, most of them are graduates of Whittier High School. And at Rio Hondo College, uh, the, uh, they still think of me as part of them, and I think of them as part of me because uh, I try to give them credit because they have been very good to me. Uh, they have designated me as a fellow of the college for making uh, significant uh, contributions to the college. Uh, 
they're uh, 50 years of uh, instruction, uh, metal, a gold medallion, uh, it was a medallion, and they pinned that on us, you know, uh, just a couple of years ago, and uh, in 19, or 2050, 2013, that was, uh, you know, this is really something. And uh, the county supervisors uh, gave me a big you know, proclamation. The city of Whittier had me as a, the community hero at the Whittier Day at the LA County Fair. And then just last September, uh, this last December, uh, the uh, Uptown Association of Whittier asked me to be the Grand Marshal for their Christmas parade. Uh, the LA Dodgers had uh, uh, designated me as a hero of the game on, the, on the July 13th of last year. Uh, something to have 50,000 people cheering here, you know, and, uh, and uh, having a lot of friends and you know, fellow, uh, you know, veterans there. A lot of my family and extended, extended family were there. And so, you know, it, it, it's just been a great thing. And it seems that uh, everywhere I turn, there, People want to <laughs> give me something, and uh, like you know, yesterday I gave this talk to the uh, Sunrise Whittier Rotary Club. Uh, they treated me like their local treasure, and then uh, a few weeks ago, the United Nations Association had its annual meeting with a focus on uh, hu human rights. And they presented me with a, a proclamation, and uh, let me give a speech. Uh, during Veterans Day uh, last year, uh, the people in South Whittier, uh, they were part of Los Angeles County, asked me to be their keynote speaker for Veterans Day. Then, on Veterans Day, I was asked to be the keynote speaker at Lake Forest, uh, where several of the coastal communities got together to have this Veterans Day, and it was just a great day. And they designated me for their uh, to, you know, be their guest speaker, uh, keynote speaker. And then on uh, the following Tuesday, uh, because Sunday and Monday were holidays at Rio Hondo College, uh, they uh, invited me, actually to, said they wanted to honor me as a veteran, so I gave a speech there. And uh, so, you know, things have been, <laughs> have been okay. Uh, this. On April, the first Saturday in April, I think it is, or the second Saturday, anyway, the city of Downey is having a uh, uh, you know, Veterans Day, uh, recognizing veterans and uh, having a breakfast. And they asked me to be a guest of honor. So <laughs> everywhere you turn now, <laughs> You got a busy schedule nowadays, huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't know that uh, uh, my service uh, in the U.S. Army was going to take up so much of my time. But because I'm still around, and uh, because I also have this experience of the, the being in turn, uh, it, it just is... Uh, uh, well, it's an opportunity to, for these people to hear firsthand uh, someone who has had these experiences. And I, I feel there's a sort of mission on my part that 
if I am asked to do something, and I can do it uh, to and spread this word uh, to other people. A lot of people just don't realize that uh, uh, not only about the 442nd, but that 6,000 Japanese Americans fought in the Pacific War. That they, people had no idea that they would allow Japanese Americans to fight there. In fact, uh, a colleague of mine at the college said, oh, they wouldn't ask you to go there. They wouldn't want you there. And I said, that's where you're absolutely wrong. That 6,000 or more were there to interpret, to interrogate, to decode, uh, in, in, to uh, uh, take uh, uh, communications from uh, enemy uh, lines and uh, give them to the high command, uh, our forces. Uh, General MacArthur said, in no time in history uh, was the U.S. Army better prepared before engagement because they knew what the plans were. Mm -hmm. So were you guys eventually able to return to the home that you had left in Almonte? Oh, no, I'm sorry that uh, I don't know what happened to their house. Uh, we were on leased land and the house was moved there, so I, I, I don't know. I, I have no idea what that, happened. That was just lost after yeah, you guys. Yeah, this was lost. I, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I just, uh, you know, when we got back, it was for a while. It was hard to find a place to stay, mm -hmm. but then uh, uh, my brothers, my sister, and I. Uh, lived in downtown Los Angeles for a while in, uh, in Boyle Heights and I went to college I was in uh, at USC and uh, uh, we went to the same church and uh, that's how I met my wife uh, went to a it's called the Union Church of Los Angeles and uh, the young people there decided to go to the beach after the service and, uh, and I happened to be lucky enough that uh, uh, I was able to buy things at the Army surplus store, and one was a Model A uh, or, or Model B uh, Ford with a Mercury engine. And so uh, it was a powerful little car, and, and, uh, and I saw this young woman not standing there, and she didn't have a ride. I said, you want to ride? Said, yeah, okay. <laughs> so that's how we met. Wow. And she was then a, just home from, a, uh, from University of Redlands. Mm -hmm. This was in 1948. So that's just before I started at USC. Now, if you had any advice that you could offer for my generation or future generations... Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, you should take every experience you have as a foundation for later life. Uh, even bad things that happen, uh, you can take and do something positive. So that's, that's one thing I would say that's very, very important. Uh, there is a thing that uh, I read some time ago that Chelsea uh, Clinton said, about her grandmother, and she said, it's really important what you do, uh, what is really important is what you do when something happens to you, you know, it's rather than uh, what you didn't do, it's what you do when something happens to you. So, you know, like in my case, being interned and, and having, uh, going to my senior year in an internment camp high school, there was absolutely no structure, uh, you know, to begin with. And so I and several others felt that we needed to have some kind of uh, normalcy. And so we developed student clubs and student government, uh, developed a constitution for the student body. And all those things 
uh, help me in my later life. So I'd say, you know, you take uh, whatever comes to you and take the positive things that you can do and build on it. Mm -hmm. uh, that's one thing. Then, you know, some other things is, uh, you know, treat people decently, uh, fairly. And uh, you find that if you treat people and you expect the best of them, usually you're not disappointed. So, and I'd say give credit to your, the people who have helped you and give credit to people who do things. You know, I find that uh, uh, oftentimes even officers and administrators, uh, when they are elevated, uh, they want credit for themselves. And I know of one person who was so jealous when someone else in the department got some kind of award, you see, that one should be happy that that person got an award. And you express that. And I think it, uh, it doesn't hurt you to do that, but it, uh, it does a lot to the person who has been honored. So I think those things are important. Uh, be healthy. That's, you know, you can't do anything unless you're, you have health. And uh, so that means eating good food and uh, avoid bad things, you know, don't smoke, uh, you know, don't take drugs, whatever it is. Uh, try to be healthy. And then try to be mentally healthy by uh, engaging with other people. You, know, you join groups, uh, they can become your friends. And uh, so you have a lot of friends. Uh, interacting is uh, probably a very important for mental health. Uh, one of the problems of aging is that uh, some people uh, begin to isolate themselves. They don't want to see people. And uh, that uh, is a downward spiral, you know. Once you start that road, uh, you'll be gone. Uh, I recall that uh, uh, there's a fellow I know whom I admired. Uh, when he retired, he says, I'm through with it. I'm just going to sit around. I'm not going to do anything. Well, he was gone. He was, uh, you, you have to have some purpose. And uh, so, and usually purpose beyond yourself uh, inspires you to do things and keep you alive. So those are some things I, I would pass on. Well, I want to thank you very much for okay. sitting down with me and okay. sharing your experiences. Okay. Well, you're welcome. And thank you for your service. Well, I'm glad to, to be uh, helpful to you. I, I think you're doing an admirable thing. And uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, I feel that, uh, well, for instance, in my uh, current life, I, you know, I do Tai Chi, that's a, a very uh, a soft way to exercise uh, mind, body, you know, the coordination. And I go to the fitness center at Rio Hondo College. And I'm probably four times as young, or four times as old, as the people there. And uh, the supervisor there, Kathy Kudelko, said, now remember, you're a role model for these guys. You're the poster boy. So, uh, and so many people have told me that uh, that I'm, uh, you know, a role model for them. Or they, that I, I was just surprised the other day. A woman uh, told me that she has continued painting because of me. And I, she's not my student. It was just a, a uh, fellow artist mm -hmm. and, uh, and quite talented. But she said, it's a kind of you, and your, your encouragement. And, mm -hmm. Well, and so uh, as, as long as I can be of some 
value to people, I, I, I think I'll enjoy being around. Well, thank you again okay. very much. Well, you're welcome. <laughs>